Hello and welcome back to the Arcane Forge. My name's Jess and today we're going to be covering a Monster Monday, a series of videos where I talk about a creature from D&D's lore, I talk about its lore and its mythology and what it's like in game as well, while I try and illustrate one of these characters in my own style. If you're new to the channel and you're concerned that I might be slowly transforming into a very very gay clown, this is not how I tend to usually look and that's because it is Pride Month 2022 here on the Arcane Forge and it's actually my first Pride being out as a transgender a woman. That means I've got 32 years worth of makeup to wear and I am damn determined to wear all of it at once. But anyway, with it being Pride, I wanted to make a whole month of Pride themed content, queer themed content. And I thought a really good addition to that list would be Coralon, the canonical deity of the elves, the creator god, goddess, or however you want to talk about it, of elven kind. And also gods give us a really interesting opportunity to draw something that's totally outside of the box. But I've waited on for long enough. Let's get started with the video. Let's talk about Coralon. So today's topic was suggested by Kaylin. Kaylin, you sent the you sent me the pronunciation, but I'm still struggling with it. Either way, E.S. Laval, or at least they were the first person to mention Dare to the Elves in my recent memory. And Kaylin is a very lovely and active member of our Discord community, which, by the way, is open to everyone. So if you want to meet Kaylin and talk to me and everybody else in this lovely community, I'll make sure to leave a link down below where you can find our Discord. Come and chat. One of the reasons why I really wanted to cover Coralon in Pride Month is that. Coralon Larethian. Odd for a god to have a surname, I think. <clears throat> but Coralon is the gender fluid deity of elven kind in DD. Their creator god, although Coralon doesn't seem to have really intended to have created the elves, as most gods and goddesses tend to regard their progeny. <clears throat> the elves literally are a part of Coralon, miniature fragments of one god, which is probably why they come across as superior and aloof. They were spawned unwittingly when Coralon was wounded during a great battle with Grumpsh, the god of orcish kind. Coralon drove a magical blade of glittering starlight into the orcish god's eye, hence why Grumpsh is now known as Grumpsh One-Eye, and orcish wizards, sorcerers, whatever you want to call them, those with a lot of magical power tend to carve out one of their eyes in order to gain this magical affinity to be closer to their god. But in the process of carving this eye out of this god of orcs, it left Coralon open to Grumpsh's blade, which struck very, very deep. And from the blood that trickled from that wound, the first elves sprang into existence, and the droplets of this divine icor made contact the earth. The elves seem to have a bit of a mixed opinion on Coralon as a result of their creation. Some definitely worship this divine being, donning silver circlets and gossamer robes of the brightest azure, proudly displaying the symbol of a starburst or what's called a quarter moon, the two icons, the symbols of Coralon, and a quarter moon for those unfamiliar as I was, turns out to just be another term for a crescent moon, or perhaps a slightly fatter crescent moon in between like a crescent and a half moon if that makes sense. But the crescent being a symbol that Coralon themselves actually wore in the form of an amulet, but not being an intended creation of this god has left the elves feeling both a sense of thankful reverence and simultaneously a longing, a feeling of being forgotten, most notably this can be seen in the elvish paladin order who refer to themselves as the Fellowship of the Forgotten Flower, who collect and watch over various ancient and forgotten elven relics and worship Coralon. But worship of Coralon isn't expected of all elves, even though they might refer to themselves as a protector of their offspring. Some elves view their creation being essentially a mistake or a byproduct of an injury and thus not planned or intended as reason enough to not worship Coralon. Indeed, Coralon shows little interest in being an active participant in a religion of any kind. They are a deity of many of the things that elves value very highly, like magic, music, art in all of its forms, crafts, poetry, and leastly combat. But Coralon would be a deity of these things with or without the admiration of the elves. So some elves see Coralon as aspirational, like someone who's living your dream perhaps, but maybe not someone whose favour you need to seek in order to excel in those things. Coralon has their own things going on after all. They're in a near endless battle for survival against basically their ex-wife, who turned out to be Lolf the Spider Queen, who keeps constantly trying to assassinate them. On top of that, like most elves, Coralon is aloof and distant, but dialed up to a deified personification, an extreme of self-involvement. So while as kind and as caring as elves can be, Coralon is likely to be the kind of person at a party who is just desperate for you to finish speaking so that they can tell their own story. Some elves have struck upon the realisation that they are 
literal pieces of this deity, this god's blood manifest into sentient life all of its own. They are divine, just very, very small. So why worship a deity who is you? Is worshipping yourself self-love the ultimate form of worshipping Corallon? Does it even matter? You are literally the god or goddess who created you, and they seem to be not totally interested in what you're up to right now. So I guess why worship them at all? Corallon's another one of these characters who, for me at least, the artwork and the lore don't really seem to gel particularly well. It seems way more mundane than an artistic, creative, of war, everything deity might be. Not that the art itself was bad or anything, it was very, very skilled, but when you're given a brief and guidelines that you need to stick to, sometimes you don't get to express your complete vision. Usually, Corallon is depicted as male, light-skinned, high elf, in pretty ordinary-looking adventuring equipment. But there's a vast chasm between those illustrations and what the lore of this character actually tells us about who they are. For a start, this is a deity. When I draw deities, as I've mentioned before, I like to go beyond a sort of corporeal, mortal form, because they're an idea, a manifestation of what they represent. In Corallon's case, that includes the list of traits that I mentioned earlier, including magic, the arts, creativity, and more. While Corallon needs to be all of those things, they're also the deity of chaos, or chaotic good alignments, that is. The Elvish people are historically chaotic in alignment. They value freedom of expression very, very highly. Their lives are simply too long to be tied down by any allegiances to any governments and empires who might rise and fall several times within their massive lifetimes, or even often a single partner. If they happen to marry or fall in love with a mortal, then they're likely to live several times longer than them, meaning that attachments tend not to be something that you can hugely depend on for an elf. Not always, that could be totally different from person to person, but culturally, if you have near immortality, then everything's constantly changing. It's like trying to get attached to the consumable goods in your pack. You know eventually that that's going to go away and be used up in a single moment. The elves kind of have that attitude often. I remember reading online a long time ago that the attitude of elves should be thought of as the attitude between dogs and humans. That in your long life, if you're a fan of dogs, if you're going to have dogs in your life, then you're likely probably going to have several because dogs live on average for about 15 years and humans on average live for much longer than that. So they will be your best friend, you'll be best friends with each other, but you're likely to have several best friends in your life, but to this dog you're going to be their whole world. You might even help them have puppies and then raise generations and generations of these dogs all spawning from this one litter. So too, humans might regard elves as these people who have been in their lives, in their family lines, for as long as their family has been a thing. But to the elf, you are one of several people that they've met, and you might become absolutely besotted with this person, but you know that there's going to be another one, eventually. So attachments and allegiances tend not to be their thing, and chaos is more what they function on, that life is change and that things are constantly changing for you. If you looked outside your window and everything was in fast forward, it was on double speed, you wouldn't get too attached to all the flowers outside because the seasons would be constantly changing and all this kind of stuff. So too is the case with Corallon on a massive scale. To the extent that Corallon canonically isn't consistently one gender, but likes to have access to all of them, to embody what they please whenever they fancy it. This is why elves, who are literally made out of Corallon juice, are so famously feminine or androgynous. Why it's so hard, simply by looking at an elf, to tell whether or not they were born female or male, whether they were assigned male or female at birth. They will have fairly narrow features, very oval faces, they're all very slim, tend not to be very curvy creatures, and they will tend to generally have quite long hair, so it kind of, there's not much giving the game away in terms of how they choose to present themselves. But also, elves can canonically switch their gender overnight. I think that's even a feat in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything now, but I tend to just give that to my elves in general. That, when they take a long rest, they can just wake up as whatever gender they choose, and have a body that perfectly reflects that. I tend not to give that as a feat, I just let all of my elves do that, because it seems like a fun addition to the player species, and it shouldn't really affect anything about how they are played, really. More than that, though, this explains why we have so many different types of elves, and why they're so adaptable. Corallon is a kind of roiling, boiling mass of chaotic energy that takes whatever form that it chooses, picking up elements of its different environment. So, too, the elves are incredibly adaptable, and often within a single generation, completely change their entire 
entire aesthetics, their skin colour, their hair, their attitudes, and so on, including even sea elves can breathe underwater, and it didn't take them long to adapt in this way. The elves are probably the most chaotic and adaptable species that you can play in D&D. They have this stock kind of template of pointy-eared, humanoid, athletic-looking things, but within that, depending on where they live, they can vary wildly and become almost an entirely different species with this same sort of template. In D&D's history, we've ended up with sea elves, as I mentioned before, the Avariel, which are winged elves, the drow, dark elves, the Lythari, who are sort of a species of wood elves who can transform into wolves at their own will. They're basically sort of lycanthropes, but they don't have the kind of werewolf in between stage, they're just wolf or elf. High elves, which are split into moon elves, sun elves, and star elves, all looking slightly different. Wild elves or green elves, wood elves, the grey elves, the Eladrin, shadow elves, painted elves, rock seeker elves, deep elves, snow elves, and that's just the ones that I can think of off the top of my head. Head. There are bound to be tons more that I'm forgetting. And that's all because Carlon is a chaotic deity who constantly adapts and absorbs the energy of their environment and literally consistently rebuilds themselves anew over and over again, making ever more beautiful versions of themselves to better embody the traits that they admire or a situation demands right this very second. We're told that Carlon took on a male form and that of a golden elf's appearance for a single battle to deal with Grumsh, and then they could have very well looked entirely different thereafter. So Carlon is fluid in every sense of the word. Fluid in divinity, fluid in energy, in spirit, in matter, in gender, in attitude, everything. So they're really hard to pin down and a great challenge visually to try and depict this creature that embodies all of these traits. As with all deities native to D&D's lore, there are a few aspects, even with a being as non-conforming as Carlon, which are solid, tangible realities that we can draw upon to illustrate this character. For a start, we know that they appear elf-like, or have some of the common elvish features often, and for sure, they like the way that elves look. They carry a crescent moon amulet, whose depiction very much varies depending on the artist, in a book entitled Demi-Human Deities, written by Eric L. Boyd, in 1998, we're told that, quote, they always appeared wearing a sky blue cloak, a large amulet displaying a crescent moon with a circle, and a pair of dazzling gauntlets, end quote. So that's something to work with for sure. Dazzling gauntlets is something that I'd not heard of before. They also carry a collection of elvish named items and weapons and tools, who I'm gonna try and pronounce, probably butcher, but then it's a fantasy language, so you can't really get it wrong, I guess. Don't come for me, Lord of the Rings enthusiasts. I know it's a real language also made up watching you. So, we've got Sahan... Sahandrian? Sahandrian. Sahandrian. A, quote, glittering longsword, which was the weapon used to cut Grumsh's eye. And it's said to cause agonising pain to anyone who tries to wield it, aside from Carlon. But this pain is even worse if you happen to be a goblinoid of some kind, because screw you, I guess. I would have thought orc, but, you know, Carlon's sword can make it do whatever they want. An interesting thing that I thought would be fascinating is if there are stats for this thing, which I might have to homebrew. Maybe that's something we do in a magic item workshop. But if only Carlon can wield this without pain, does that mean that elves could, because they are literally pieces of Carlon? So any elf would be able to wield this sword without pain, but anyone else would be in absolute agony. I think that'd be fascinating. Maybe half-elves will struggle because they're not fully a piece of Carlon. Or maybe Eladrin would have the easiest time with it. Who knows? Leave your ideas down in the comments, because I might just homebrew that. Alongside this, they have a magical longbow called Amlath Hanar, and a quiver of radiant arrows who can never run out. So unlimited arrows, but it was also apparently a able to hit its target perfectly, even if they were over a mile away. We're also told in Demi-Human Deities that they had a wand that worked like a staff of power, a staff of magi, and a wand of frost with unlimited uses, end quote. All of which are items from previous editions of D&D, but you get the picture. Very, very powerful magic item. Carlon is a being of magic itself, capable of immensely powerful sorceries, which can be passed down in part to the elvish people. They can cast almost any spell, to any level with ease, with a particular affinity for summoning air elementals, apparently. And that's because Carlon, I think, is typified by their affinity for freedom, and the freedom of choice. As a result, they're immune to anything that limits their movement or imprisons them, that causes permanent wounds of any kind, presumably because Carlon doesn't want any missing limbs and fingers unless they fancy looking that way at a particular moment, so their appearance, number of limbs, and so on would always be to their liking. I presume this means that they are under 
likely be able to be scarred unless they think it looks particularly cool. Nothing can tamper with Corallon's mind either, presumably because it's such a swirling vortex of chaos that no one can truly perceive it or understand it, and similarly illusion spells similarly have no effect on them. Which I'm guessing is why elves are also incapable of being put to sleep, being charmed, and in the past, in previous editions, they were immune to ghoul paralysis, diseases that would affect other sort of more mortal creatures. But in fact, the only thing that can seem to harm Corallon is a magic weapon that has a plus three value or higher, which are actually pretty hard to come by, or should be at least, as a lesson to DMs. So when I asked people on Discord what they wanted to see from a Pride Month in terms of content, three things really stood out to me. There's a lot of people requesting some more visibility for gender fluid people, for non-binary people, and for asexual people. Because they tend not to be um, as openly discussed or openly represented in other forms of media that the rest of the Alphabet Mafia to get shown in, basically. That's one of the reasons why I wanted to cover Carlon, because they are like the deity of being gender fluid, as far as I'm concerned. Which is why I've used the gender fluid flag as the colour palette for Carlon. One of the ways that I really wanted to try and do this was to build up Carlon's clothes and items might be more tangible and consistent and solid. Corlon themselves is constantly reinventing themselves, choosing in a moment how they want to appear and specifically what gender they want to be. Of all the things about Corlon, that seems to be one of the things that comes up constantly over and over and over again in all the lore, that Corlon is both and neither. Which initially said non-binary to me, but being able to like embody a gender when you fancy it and look how you want to, depending on how you feel that day, what gender you seem most alive to at the time, I think that's pretty close to what being gender fluid is. So I really wanted to hone in on that. And one of the things that I did to do that was to draw several torsos for Carlon and have them all overlap. I imagined that you could sort of animate this so it's sort of shifting between one or another, or ideally that they would all sort of interweave with one another. And only the places where they overlap is what you kind of perceive as Carlon at any given moment. Not totally sure if that came across. I tried to use various sort of screens and overlay layers to kind Kind of create that effect. It looks very busy, it does look very chaotic, and I do like that about it. I think if I were to draw this again, I would like to sort of maybe put some more sort of liquid elements in the illustration to kind of show this shifting, but I do like the kind of prismatic effect of these various forms intersecting one another, even if they're not totally visible. But anyway, I hope you liked it as well. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you do enjoy my content, I really need your help to grow the channel and to support it, so please recommend this video or another video on my channel to two of your friends and with that way we can start to build up the channel and reach more people. If you want to support the channel in a very helpful and personal way then I'll make sure to leave a link down below to my Patreon where you get all sorts of rewards for helping me out in that capacity and for helping me to make these videos which take the sort of equivalent time of a full-time job. I want to stick around, I want to make this kind of content for you guys for as long as I possibly can and I can only do that with your help. Think of us like the little corner shop on your high street trying to compete with Starbucks or something. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to leave it a little like so you can try and defeat the YouTube algorithm, appease that particular deity of chaos. Until next time, I hope you have a fantastic Pride Month. Make sure to stay safe, celebrate yourself, love yourself, and happy monster hunting. Bye!